Welcome to Vision Pros, the show all about spatial computing, Vision OS, and getting work done on the Apple Vision Pro. I'm Tim Chen, host of the show. You can have a uh, like multi-threaded conversation. So if you're in a group with like four or five people, it is technically possible now, because I tested this with a group, to have two sets of conversations happening at the same time. And that, to me, has been the massive missing piece to every like video conferencing experience I've had when it comes to like work or like virtual conferences or something like that. Welcome back to another episode of Vision Pros. In this episode, we are joined by Charlie Chapman, the developer of Spatial Noise and Level Headed. We begin this episode with lots of various discussion points around Vision OS and the Apple Vision Pro. Then we dive into spatial noise and touch very briefly on monetization and the Let's Vision OS conference he attended in China. If you'd like to support the podcast, first off, please head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. These reviews are super important, helping to send the right signals to Apple to make this podcast more discoverable. Secondly, head over to visionpros.fm slash Patreon, where you can support the Patreon or subscribe in Apple Podcasts. By supporting the podcast financially, you'll get early access to both Vision Pros and iPad Pros. My great thanks to everyone that supports the show. It is greatly appreciated. With that, here's my discussion with Charlie. Enjoy. Welcome to the podcast, Charlie. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I was going to say welcome back, but you've been on the iPad Pros podcast, but this is the first time yeah. on Vision Pros. So, welcome. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It feels like coming back, but you're right. It is a, it's technically a different podcast. Yes. <laughs> So, uh, for those that have not listened to iPad Pros and your awesome episode, uh, can you kind of introduce yourself and kind of the work you do? Yeah, so uh, I'm Charlie Chapman. I'm a uh, iOS developer, indie developer on the side, um, and currently I'm a developer advocate at a company called Revenue Cat. Um, but very much live in the apps space uh, and do it as my side hobby, my main job, and most of my friend groups these days are all indie developers and everything. So it's kind of just my life at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. And yeah, WWDC is coming up. So I'm sure that'll be a fun time of year for you uh, over at Revenue Cat and just personal. Oh, stuff yeah. Well. Yeah. 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 My uh, when I got into this space, um, I was very excited to like go to my first WWDC. And then that ended up being 2020. Uh, yeah. so, so I had to go a couple of years, uh, without, you know, actually getting it. And so I was very, very excited whenever we got something going again. And so very much look forward to it every year as our way of getting everybody together, um, and all kind of getting hang out. Yeah. I just got, this is very unrelated, but I just got the, the notice that Lord of the Rings extended editions are coming back to theaters, uh, basically the weekend oh. before WWDC. So Saturday, Sunday and WWDC keynote Monday. There's going to be the uh, extended 4K HDR remasters in theaters. I'm imagining some group of gre- geeks will be watching in um, San Jose or Cupertino area that uh, those showings, and that could be a fun time. Is it like all three? Like what? All three. I, I haven't so seen this. Saturday, like back is to back to back. Then Sunday is Two Towers, and then Monday is Return Oh goodness. Of King. Uh, at least in my area, um, it was like 4 p.m. showings on like Saturday and Sunday. Then like on Monday, it was like a 7 p.m. showing type thing. So, <laughs> man, that takes me back to to like high school. You know, parties. Uh, well, I say parties in air quotes. My version of parties were going to people's houses where they did like marathons of all of them, and you kind of half watched them while hanging out. Absolutely, yeah. But yeah, I, I the dates just was that's why it's WWC weekend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah nice nice but anyways uh two main topics i wanted to dive into today uh, your app spatial noise uh for vision os and the whole i guess topic of monetizing vision os apps uh so those are two main things but before we dive into that i just want to kind of get an update on where you're at with vision os apple vision pro it's now late april as we record so i'm curious just general thoughts Oh man. I so I'm I'm weird in this category because I, you know, I bought it day 1. I've built multiple apps for it. I flew across the world to go to the first conference, you know, for this and gave a talk. And yet, at least in most of my my sort of like friend groups where we talk about all this stuff, I'm 
within the context of that group anyway, I'm definitely the pessimist uh, of the group here. Oh, interesting. Um, okay. I yeah 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 I, I should have warned you about this ahead <laughs> yeah, of time. Yeah, the uh, uh, I, I realized that when I was preparing. By based on that introduction, I would have uh, expected the opposite there. <laughs> exactly, most people yes. do. I, it's weird. So I I kind of come at it from two different angles, which is, you know, the technology itself is super cool and interesting, and I find it very 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 interesting of a product. The pessimist side more has to do with. Is this really like a mass market uh, device on the level of the iPad or the Apple Watch? I don't think it's fair to ever say anything's going to be on the level of the iPhone, right. but you know what I mean. And that's where I don't know, but I've always had a lot of hesitation. If you, it's funny if you uh, if you go to my personal blog, the last thing that was written was uh, was an article while on the plane to New York to go to the Apple lab uh, for the vision pro. So I could like try it beforehand. And I kind of wrote up like, here's all my thoughts because there's certain things that don't quite make sense. And I can't talk about it after this, right? Was the idea. And it's interesting how much my thoughts have stayed the same. And maybe that's just an indication that I'm, I pre decided a lot of things, but I do think some of it is like, there's things that I just don't quite get yet. And I think those all still, kind of apply and we can we can kind of dive into those but to like step back and answer your question then i feel similar to i to what i did at the beginning which is it's an incredibly cool piece of technology with a lot of cool demos um it is by far the greatest device i have uh for demoing an apple vision pro to friends uh that is its primary use other than development obviously it's a great dev kit as well but once you, once for me at least, once I get past the sort of demo experience of like, look at the dinosaur, you know, sitting in your living room, watch this five minute uh, video experience that Apple's released, play a couple of these like sort of interesting little experiences. I don't quite see how it fits into my life, at least um, in almost any way. But there are a couple of specific areas, which I'm sure we're going to talk about here. And I have specific reasons why maybe it doesn't work as well for me gotcha yeah and you're not you're not someone that has a couple hours every night to watch a movie by himself uh and you'd rather <laughs> yes yeah right although that is so that was one of the use cases i thought it would have for me and what i've personally found is it's not really good enough to overtake the inconvenience of wearing it for watching a movie even um, mostly, mostly has to do with, well, one, it's just uncomfortable, you know, having a thing on your head, uh, and you feel kind of weird, whatever. Uh, and like, you can't like eat a snack or something, at least not comfortably, or I can't anyway, uh, or drink liquid or something. Yeah. There's certain snacks that I think are, are better, like M&Ms and stuff is better than say, yeah. You, right. Uh, yeah. That's uh, true. Nachos that's true. Would, would be, uh, anything that's like a little liquidy, uh, has the risk of, <laughs> Uh, impact it, you know, hitting the headset as on the way to your mouth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's less like I try not to baby it um, because I really do view it as a like a piece of equipment for my job, sort of. Um, and so I'm I'm not too bad about that in terms of fear of liquid. But it's like it's yeah, it's when you lift a cup up, it hits the glass because you're not you know used to having a big thing like sticking out of your face. Um, but the other thing is the field of view in particular is just not wide enough. And it's not just the literal field of view in terms of like what is left to right, how much you can see, but it's like, what is the actual sweet spot of it being good looking? Because as it starts getting to the fringes, it doesn't look good. And what I found is I end up having to make whatever I'm watching. If I'm watching a movie or something, I end up having to make it pretty small, still bigger than my TV, but not like, a big screen TV, like not like a movie theater. Otherwise I have to turn my head to watch it. And like, that's horrible, especially if I'm sitting on my couch and my head's resting against the back pillow. I find if I turn my head, it kind of grips the back pillow a little bit and then it shifts the headset. And once the headset starts shifting separate from my head, it breaks the whole illusion and it's kind of uncomfortable. Yeah. For at least Apple's whatever setup, I find the front middle row kind of perfect as far as i see the whole screen without turning my head and you know the sides seem pretty good at that yeah. point too as well 
Do you watch you watch like whole movies and stuff in it? Oh regularly? yeah, I'm I'm upstairs, kind of like snuggling with my you know one year old who's sleeping in my lap. Uh, so I'm just kind of like stuck in a recliner for many hours each night. So I'll yes, it's perfect. I remember that. those. There's days. no TV in that room, and I, I wouldn't want one in there. <laughs> it's just perfect where you're you're just stuck. I don't, and also I can operate, you know, apps and kind of you know be reading and kind of just do some very basic things with one hand where that would be kind of hard to do with even my, my, an iPad, you know, at that point. Yeah, no, definitely because it's floating. It's not, yeah. you don't need a place to, for it to like, there's nothing I can hold. drop accidentally, you know, <laughs> even a phone. Yeah. The sort of like, case, it'll just like, you know, drop out of hand sometimes. If... The sort of private viewing experience. I mean, it's a big part of the AirPods, even on their own too, with an Apple TV is yeah. like, um, whenever my kids were little, it was a real struggle to like watch a lot of things because I like it loud. Like I do if you're watching a blockbuster, you know, uh, I, I'm not, I'm actually like weird in, in that I don't like things like super loud, but if you're watching a big movie, I'm okay with it being loud, but I need to be able to hear it. Right. Um, and so there was a big list of movies that I like couldn't really watch, uh, for a good while. Once the kids were old enough that they could like open their door, but young enough that, you know, you couldn't leave them alone or anything. Um, it, there was a lot of movies that's like if there's cursing or violence or whatever, you know, it kind of cut me off from being able to watch a lot of those things. And that this would be like perfect for that. Yeah. So and it is a device that really it depends on your day to day. How much alone time do you have? Because it's it's not a communal device. It, it's it's kind of yeah. weird to use it around other people. I'll have full conversations with people when they enter the room and they're fine they know i can see them and whatnot but i wouldn't walk around the house probably um doing that if i'm not home alone right yeah yeah exactly yeah and like the other case is sort of as a desktop right yeah. that's a kind of, kind of commonly referred to thing and personally i just find the i find the screen sharing is extremely uh screen sharing the mac mirroring right yeah uh, it's extremely well done like i'm very impressed with it you know, technically again, like many things with this, but for me, it's like, I have a studio display and it just can't remotely compete with that. No. Uh, yeah. In terms of the resolution, even physically possible with the types of displays this thing has. Um, yeah. The only less, way that would be, um, better is if you're using your Mac display for like a, a like final cut, a single app. And then off to the side, you're having a bunch of vision pro apps and you're trying to do, that kind of thing versus just Mac apps. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And actually editing in final C or in premiere pro for me, um, that's the one time where I found I actually used it. And I've only done it once or twice um, in my living room as a, like, this is kind of nice because it was a big screen. It's like single task kind of, it's really big. Yeah. The fact that it doesn't render text super well, wasn't a big deal. Um, Cause it's, it's, you know, video editing. Um, and I wasn't doing like color correct. Well, actually color correcting, it might be pretty good for, um, cause resolution isn't big of a deal and it's color reproduction is probably really good. I don't actually know the details on that, but knowing Apple, I'm sure it is. Um, but like if I was editing photographs or something, I would definitely rather do that on a, my Mac monitor, even my laptop monitor, just because those are tuned so well, it's just smaller. Um, but when it comes to coding and stuff, I personally way prefer looking at my regular, monitor even though it's a 14 inch it's way smaller um i find that just so much more comfortable to work in um in in large part because even if i'm just using my mac my macbook pro monitor on its own i'm still in a multi-screen environment because my watch will ding my phone will ding and i'll be answering whatever and if my phone goes off and i look at my phone in the vision pro it's like that is a horrible experience um and with a laptop you'd be bending over a bit though right or is it a bit do you have some kind of setup where yeah. it's elevated yeah okay yeah but it's still more comfortable than uh yeah <laughs> see yeah. i'm already trying to i know I, yeah. so here's the thing I, I hang out with a lot of people who are more enthusiastic and so i tend to be uh almost mean in uh i'm more i sound so much more pessimistic than i actually am even now i'm doing that because i'm interacting with people who are usually 
way more enthusiastic. But I, I, I derogatorily call it a uh, face bucket frequently just because it makes people mad. Um, and so I almost just did that. So if I say that again, it's because I'm a jerk, uh, not because I actually think it's that bad. Uh, <laughs> yeah. One, one cool experience I had working in the vision pro is part of my work is, you know, preparing for these interviews and I would put my daughter to in her crib and, uh, my wife came in the room and turned off all the lights and I then just like turned on a, an environment in light mode and I, it felt like daytime again and I just cranked yeah. through um, the questions, you know, and I was able to, you know, put your app in there and kind of experience it while you draft up the questions and um, there's something really cool about just I had the keyboard trackpad in front of me and my little... um. I've got one of those products that kind of combines the magic trackpad and keyboard and a little tray that just sits in my lap and I was in pitch darkness. So I was going to ask, do and, you, yeah. are you in, fu- are you fully immersed at that point? I was uh, at that point cause, um, at pitch dark and, uh, there's, there's no backlight on the magic keyboard. The keyboard anyway. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, so so you're hard- just having to feel around anyway. Yeah. And when, and when I'm typing, like if I'm writing, that's not a problem. It's when I need a bunch of keyboard shortcuts and I need to find like the yeah. one and the five. Like, but if I'm just writing, I can be fully immersed in type just fine. And that was a really yeah, that's good experience. True. Yeah. And it never complained to me about low light, which it can, but I guess setting up right in um, real high climate. I've had great luck with that. that. Yeah. Even, even on an airplane, long haul, overnight, very dark, and I'm on an airplane. Yeah. Um, it would pop up. It was very annoying um, because, you know, you'd shift around or if, if you lift something in front of you or if I looked down, it would then it would be like, oh, you need to you need more light and it would reset everything. I'm like watching a movie or something. Right. Um, and so that was annoying. But for the most part, I found it pretty surprisingly stable for me. Yeah. The most annoying part about the low light or you're too close to an object um things is you have to dismiss it every time it won't just like fade away naturally yeah because i i work and it resets your environment especially if you're in an immersive environment okay. watching a movie yeah and then, that's where it was really killing me the other thing with like i work in a little nook so i'm surrounded by i've got a wall next to me a wall behind me and you know i'm basically the only thing open is in front of me right so if i turn my yeah. head and look towards a wall i get the you're too close to something Every single time, I have to dismiss it every single oh, time. Oh, wow. Yeah. Even when it's bright? Yeah, because it's about closeness to an object. Not That makes sense. Yeah, not about light. Yeah, no, that's yeah. pretty annoying. So, at the, yeah. So, at times, I can... I hope, I'm hoping with Vision OS 2, they might, like, offer some ways to just, you know, if that pops up, just let it dismiss itself after a bit. Yeah, yeah, we have a point uh, in the notes for later to talk about Vision OS two, but like, I definitely have things in a similar in a similar vein uh, in terms of thoughts on that type of management. Yeah, but it is super nice for me. At least I, I'm not using the Mac. I don't have a modern Mac. This actually inspires me to one day inspire my wife to when she upgrades her laptop to not trade in so i could have her m1 macbook air because that seems like a great companion to this um, you don't have a modern mac meaning you have an intel mac i have a 20 or you don't have a mac mini and a 2011 macbook air uh so i don't have macs that wow. run anything <laughs> close to modern uh yeah yeah so you're recording this on what then? Uh, a Zoom H6 audio recorder hooked up to the hooked iPad. Hooked up to. So I got your audio feeding out to the iPad through a Thunderbolt dock. And then my audio is through a, just a mic hooked directly to the audio recorder. Oh, right. So the uh, so the audio is different between the two. Yes. Yeah, one's so recording and on one's... iPad mic versus uh, what's actually okay. captured. That makes the, sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, man, that's, which is also in my list of wants. A lot of my lists of wants here are like things that also have been bugging me about the iPad for a decade or two. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the iPad, please uh, let us have more robust audio stuff. Uh, yeah, this next seriously. Update. And maybe that also goes down to the Vision Pro, which could also use some enhancements there uh, also for playing multiple videos at the same time, which I thought it could do, but evidently only within the same app. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And like, I mean, I guess it's, it's not happening anytime soon with the vision pro. Cause there's no, there's no input 
Um, I mean, I know technically you can with the developer strap, but not really. I really hope that it's just a quick firmware update in Vision OS 2 to enable the battery pack to enable USB-C pass-through in that thing. <sighs> you would you would want that to be true, but then the problem is they wouldn't have developed the developer strap and sold it as an accessory if it was already wired up to have uh, data transfer going through that battery pack. So I'm guessing that's just like, yeah, it's physically not there. I know what you say is probably true. <laughs> It'd be nice though. It'd be nice. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they, they custom built this connector. It feels like it feel, but I'm guessing though, it's like, you know, they probably already wanted this, uh, the cable connecting the battery pack to this to be a very specific feel and thickness and all that stuff. And so yeah, that's right. They, it is kind of the thickness of other USB-C just charging cords versus data cords. Yeah. Yeah. So it could be a thing. I mean, it is, it's thicker than a lot of cable, like most of their cables. Right. But yeah. I'm guessing there is some reason for that. I know the voltage with this battery is all weird and different and weird, custom yeah. as well. But it'd be nice if you just you just mean like USB three speeds, and if you want Thunderbolt, use the developer strap kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, right. Because that that is the thing. Like I can't get just I I can't even get an audio line out of this thing. Like <laughs> it's it's weird. It'd be killer if you yeah. could get a a video in on it in some capacity. Because like at the end of the day, the use cases that seem to be what most people use living in this um are it's a big monitor it's either like people who use it regularly for juno for youtube or watching movies or the mac uh pass through yeah um i don't it sounds like you are using it regularly like with native apps is that is that right like when you're writing on it you're writing on it in um yeah because for me the ipad prior to this was my main computer and now this has become that and all the workflows i did an ipad pretty much transfer over one to one in some cases i had to like force a side load of apps that weren't enabled but once i did that it's been magical (laughs) ah interesting interesting see do you find i find the and uh, i am one of there's a lot of people that want to work in an ipad and just can't right right? like i'm sure you've experienced this whole they hit whatever roadblock and they don't want to deal with that or, or can't uh, yeah or just no yeah it's Actually, just something about that environment is yeah <laughs> right like to regularly live on the ipad you have to be willing to jump through a lot of hoops it kind of works against you frequently right like recording a podcast like you know there's lots of things like that um and so i guess if you're like that already with the ipad i bet a lot of those same mentalities can bring you into this environment they do uh, and it's more freeing than an ipad with the multiple display type things well, the windows, yeah right like not being restricted <laughs> to just you know an external display and the ipad screen instead just surround yourself in windows yeah the thing that kills me is the is the like window size like the which I, i'm guessing is just because the the everything is so low resolution relative to monitors that we're used to but like everything is just ginormous. I I have that same complaint. Windows need to be able to be smaller. I want smaller. Yeah, windows. way smaller. Text needs to be smaller. Like whenever you're mirroring your Mac, you can make things quite a bit smaller. And that's noticeable because it's hard to read text, which I'm guessing is why they don't do that natively. But uh, it drives me crazy because it's like I like I'm mirroring my Mac and I'm like, ooh. I can open the native messages app because I usually have the messages sitting off to the side, but now it doesn't have to use up my window. But what I found is I never look at that or use it. I just open the messages app on my Mac in the screen mirroring because it's 10 times easier because it's so small and I can actually like sit there and work with it. And you don't have to make the mouse universal control, like jump over to the other one as cool and clever as that is. Um, it's just, there's enough friction points, but the big thing is just, the messages app, everything is so big. You can read like two messages at once. Um, it, 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 I don't know. It drives me nuts. Very big. And I, and with the iPad apps, like it's great that you have the rotation thing, but I wish I could like scale the iPad app down to the iPhone size class that you, especially can cause the, the Mac does that. Yeah. 
So it's like, I don't really understand why they, why they don't let you do that. Um, Cause I can, I, uh, let me see. I think I have overcast. Yeah. I have overcast on here. So overcast on the Mac is also just an iPad app. Hmm. And yeah, I can yeah. resize it completely freely. So yeah. there's like, cause with a split, sc- yeah. In stage manager or split screen, on iPad, you can make it very tiny, just a nice, small, little, narrow window type thing. That feels like, you know, foreshadowing to Vision OS 2. That feels like the type of thing that could come, right, in Vision OS 2 is like free resizing of iPad apps because that's just a choice on the OS side. That's not something to do with developers. Did you change your default window size to be the smallest possible with the text being smaller and stuff too? Uh, no, no. So, okay. Yeah. That's a good point is I, because I'm a developer, I, I always try to use these things in their closer to default settings because I know that that's how most people are going to experience it. So when I test things, I change my dynamic type, you know, on iOS or whatever. Um, but I always try to reset everything back to default because this is the experience most people are going to have. And so I want to tune what I'm building to that experience. Gotcha. Yeah. So yeah, that's a, that's a good point is I can at least increase the density a little bit by, um, uh, vision OS lets you pick a smaller, like rendering size, right? Yeah. Cause with does the that window, let you make the window smaller or is it just it does. It makes the, window the text smaller inside too. of it? Um, okay. And yeah, that comment about only seeing two messages in the messages app. It's like sort of, but I see a lot more than that for me. <laughs> Well, and I'm probably being a little, a little uh, hyperbolic. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, I'm sure it's more than two. It might be three. No, I'm just kidding. It's it's probably like five or six. But it it's just everything. It's just so chunky and big. Yeah. Um. The other reason, and actually, the other the other reason why that might be the case is the eye tracking. Um, because like, it's essentially like an iPad or an iPhone, except everybody's hand everybody's fingers are the size of like fists and said yeah um in terms of resolution they have for making sure people are picking the right thing yeah so that might be playing into why they make everything bigger too and if that's the case that's a little scarier because simply making a higher resolution display isn't going to solve that problem um they're gonna have to make the eye tracking more accurate the eye tracking has been very cool as long as it, i don't need to recalibrate which happens every so often I hear 1.2 mm. fixes a lot of that, but I have not installed that beta. Um, but with Ferrite, I've got that app side loaded onto the Vision Pro, and I've tried audio editing with just fingers, and I have the different um, like delete and whatever as quick things on the, the bottom bar. I found eye tracking to be pretty magical with being able to... I'm looking at the end of a clip, and I can tap and bring it in pretty easily, and then it's all, pretty reliable. Yeah, it's very reliable. Which is, it seems like a small target. It's it's trying to find, and it's doing a pretty good job with that. I wonder yeah. if they like like many things. I wonder if they're doing the the buttons actually pretty big, even though the like the render maybe you and know, that art app is, is small. so optimized for the trackpad that I think a lot exactly. of those affordances carry over nicely with that. Um, and with audio editing, it is so fun just looking. At a little, I do the strip silence and you know condense kind of uh, right. motion, and I could just look at this little cough and just tap my finger, and I, I got a keyboard in my hand as well, and I'll hit you know command uh, X to just cut it out, and it's just so nice that I'm having the trackpad over to the audio clip, just like boom, boom. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it and that's nice. a you said that's a that's still an iPad app, a- so iPad I, compatible app. Yeah, it's an iPad app that is not in the store that I found a way to sideload onto it because uh, because that's an example of yeah. an app that like that would benefit from the infinite canvas, as they say. Yeah. So uh, like, if you could make that super big uh, and like really long in yeah, particular, for sure. and get way more of your timeline visible. What would be really cool, which isn't possible yeah. with the current Vision OS, is if you could wrap it around you, right? Oh, that'd be neat. Um, yeah. Because that's that's one of the other problems with making stuff big. It's cool for movies because we're used to that. But like when I start doing it with a Mac window or something, the fact that it's flat means that the stuff at the edges starts looking really weird because it's like far away from you. And so it's all distorted, you know, to the side. Um, whereas if you open a bunch of individual apps, it naturally the window management kind of puts it in a circle around you. Right. It'd be cool if you could open something like Ferrite 
and they could have a window that curves around you because it's so long. And the center is the area you're intended to work, but there's no reason why the timeline can't extend, you know, much farther than that. So that if you want to look ahead, you can turn your head and look ahead. Like that would, that would be pretty killer. Yeah. That'd be neat. And you could also have like a separate window with maybe your chapters or something that you're can edit as you're working on the audio right. kind of thing. Yeah. It kind of, it kind of like, it kind of folds back the UI paradigms to, you remember like uh, whenever I like sort of switched over to the Mac anyway, maybe, maybe the Mac has been like this for forever. Um, and I think Linux maybe is still like this, but like the idea of apps being super multi window experiences as opposed, like I remember using uh, uh shoot, what was it called? The, the open source Photoshop uh, uh, GIMP G I M P. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So like, that always drove me crazy because it was like, you know, your toolbar was a separate window literally. And it just kind of floated out there. And then your main canvas was separate, but in a vision OS context, you know, the paradigms they've already given us sort of are like that with the uh, ornaments. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's just a developer term or if that's in the normal lexicon, but yeah, like the fact that your, your toolbars and stuff can like float next to your window as opposed to overlaying your window. That alone is already taking the idea of like, we're not in a window, like we can expand out. Um, but maybe apps become more of these multi window things, uh, for that same kind of reason. Right. Yeah. And I'm curious where that all goes. Cause the multi window stuff is very cool. I can understand some people getting lost if they have like five window, five apps with a bunch of windows uh, associated with each one differently. Kind of. Yeah, that's true. As opposed to, yeah. Yeah. Like if it's an immersive experience where that's the only app you can see, um, that's one thing, but the moment it's not, that starts getting pretty confusing pretty fast. Uh, have you done any like modifications to your headset? You're just using the standard headbands at this point. No, I, um, I have, well, I printed out, this is, uh, I'm holding up to the webcam, but nobody listening can see it. This is, uh, from Christian Seelig's, uh, he made a like 3d printed thing for like a stand you can build. And I just printed the cover for it because what I've been trying to do is I find this thing is just obnoxiously big and heavy and the idea, and I, I take it around to these conferences and on planes and stuff and like usually on planes, I'm trying to make everything as small as possible. And now I'm carrying around this huge ball of a brick thing. Um, So I've been trying to think of ways to make it smaller and smaller, how I can carry it in my bag. And so did you end up getting the uh, 12 or the um, waterfield design case? No, because even that one's it's just it's too big. Like, I okay, yeah, that's like what I want. I want to build my own thing. I've never wanted to do this before now. But like, this is going to be really hard to explain. Uh, in podcast form, but I'm going to do my best. But what I want, so you know how it comes with what I call the sock on the front that yes. covers the glass. Yes. I essentially want the same thing for the backside. Okay. So I want it to just kind of go over the light seal. Um, Cause the main thing is like the glass on the inside. You want to protect in some, I want to keep something from going in there and protecting yep. it or and hitting it. So I want something that basically more or less goes over that it makes this exactly the same size essentially as it is naked Hmm. um and then maybe i could have something that goes over the stocks that sit out but even that i'm kind of like whatever i'll let those get scratched up i don't care because it's like space in my bag is very precious and my bag's already a protective layer i have a camera bag um I would love to be able to just literally throw this inside of my bag. People at the, that conference I went to were horrified when I pulled out the way I carry it, which is in a, uh, a drawstring bag, uh, you know, like a gym bag. Yeah. yeah. Um, because that's like the smallest I can like then crumple around it because all I'm really doing is I'm dropping it into my, the big open big, cavern spot of my bag. camera bag. Exactly. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't want something that's like, protecting it and adds a whole bunch because it's like i'm not putting i'm not putting a bag inside of my bag you know this isn't like a turducken situation um yeah the the stocks on it are really just 
they're kind of annoying from that perspective. They don't. Fold I wish down you could or fold them or take them off. Yeah, um, that would make a them. really big difference. Um, but yeah, that's that's not a Vision OS two. That's a uh, seemingly pushed out further in the future every day. Uh, new version of the hardware, which who knows when or if that's coming. Yeah, I'm curious the hardware trajectory because you know early days of Apple Watch, rapid processor improvements, and they got so much better year to year. I'm curious is how much of a stretch was this version one, and how, like how rapid will they be able to improve this tech? You know. Yeah, it's weird because on one hand, it feels kind of like a it, it has the feeling of like a HomePod situation where we're going to be sitting with this thing. Yes, for quite a the while. HomePod seemed like more of a not a platform, but just like an accessory. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. So I don't expect that on the software side. Like if we if we don't get like major improvements, um, because there's they could. It's like the thing that's really exciting about wwdc from the vision os perspective this year is this is the first time we've had a new platform from apple since 2015 2015 yeah so like we haven't had a a dub dub with uh with low-hanging fruit all over the place like we do right now like they're gonna get to say you can rearrange your app icons to cheers right we haven't been in that we've we've had some really mature platforms for a while now um and so but if we don't see big improvements and they could go three, honestly, best case scenario, we go three years where we still can't rearrange the apps on our home screen because there's so many other big things that happen. It's like the copy paste of it, right? If the only thing they give us is like that kind of stuff, that's going to be a little worrying. Um, but it seems like there's huge teams still dedicated to this and surely big parts of those teams are, um, are all hardware related. So it's like, surely they're doing something but that doesn't mean it's a yearly release cycle especially because the way apple operates they need to sell large volumes for any of their stuff to make any sense and they're not selling large volumes in one year so they might have to spread it out over you know more uh more years to amortize that cost to make sense with their spreadsheets or whatever um yeah and i want so i don't know i, I do i do want hardware improvements of course but um yeah I, I'm also probably, I don't know if I'd, I, I need to see what version two looks like, but I spent a lot of money in this. I, I'd want to use it and get as much life out of, out of it as I can kind of thing. Yeah. And like th- just getting it out to more countries is already taking time. So, um, I, I don't, uh, yeah, I, I mean, the rumors are all saying not to expect it for a couple of years. Um, but also it just kind of feels like it makes sense. Yeah. That being sure. said, most of the things I want, oh, well, maybe that's not true, but a large portion of what I want are hardware improvements. Um, and so, you know, knowing that those aren't coming anytime soon is a bit of a bummer, but yeah, the field that- of view, as you mentioned, was the, I guess, biggest surprise to me from what, um, cause I have a PSVR two. It was surprising to me. The field of view being a, a little less than that, um, was just, just kind of a shock to me when I started using it. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So I have a, I have a quest too. Um, so, you know, for me, it's like, everything's a giant improvement. I don't actually know what the field of view difference is. Um, but I, I don't, it's not like I, it's like a lot of things. It's most of my issues aren't like compared to other devices. Here's what's wrong with it. It's more like, because this is asking me to do completely different things, I have a completely different set of problems uh that to me need to be addressed like it is the by far the crispest nicest you know highest resolution vr headset in the world but to me when i use it for reading and all these purposes that i'm supposed to be using this for i'm like man the thing i want more than anything is more resolution (laughs) and it's like that's weird because i don't think that about the other ones but that's because they're they're trying to solve completely different problems yeah and i pretty much forget about the feel the view thing when I'm actually using it and kind of immersed in doing stuff, but uh, it's a thing that could for sure get better. It's the having to turn my head thing where that becomes a problem. Yeah. Um, I've said this before, but swivel chairs uh, really make sense with this product. (laughs) Yeah. 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 And that's true. Like if I'm sitting at my desk, it's not as big of an issue. It's more, um, 
if I was, if I'm watching a movie sitting on the couch or laying down or whatever, that's where I really notice it because turning my head is uncomfortable with a headset on in those situations. Yeah. As far as third party apps, uh, have you discovered any kind of cool ones that you're enjoying? I know it's not a, uh, easy to discover, uh, environment for, for apps at this point. <sighs> yeah. Like that's, uh, I mean, I have a real answer for you, but just to your last sentence there, that's one of the areas that I've been a little kind of frustrated is um, why is the discovery not good? Because they they have editorial teams um, that do a good job on iOS and on the iPad. And I don't really understand why it seems like the app store on Vision OS feels so dead. It's And, like, and part of that too... I think there's stuff there, but I can't find it because there's no freaking categories. Tab. That's what I mean. You should be able to browse every single app on Vision. We're at a point where back when the iPad came out, I could open up the store and I could browse and look at every app available. Here, you have to search and hope you search for something that comes up with something good in your fishing line. Exactly. Um, it's very strange yeah. because, yeah, like the, the quantity is very low. Um, which we know and like yes that is a problem sure but like they're compounding it a lot by the fact that they're they're not showing you what is there like that what's new and noteworthy or what's new and noteworthy maybe is but like there should be a list that like it's like what's new and it should literally just be what came in that day what's new Um, feels like a hand curated list kind of like how the 3d movies uh thing when you pull that up in apple vision pro that's hand curated and it's missing a lot of stuff like it is hand curated and that makes sense i'm not saying and that probably should be the first thing you see should be things that they've curated as like we think these are great but like i should be incentivized to come back to this place to find more Mm -hmm. things because like what i find something i you know i again i know i sound negative but it's like i find myself putting this on because i want to use it yeah this is why I'm so frustrated at the way they're handling gaming because it's like the only thing that to me is really fun on these is like playing a quick game or some kind of cool experience. And because they've chosen things to limit that so severely, uh, we don't have those. And so I'm just like looking for something to do. And it's like the apps, I should be able to go to the app store and be like, Oh, let me try this one. Let me try this one. But very quickly, I'm like, I've tried all of these. Like, where's the next ones? Um, and part of that is the volume of apps being built is low, but also like they highlight iPad compatible apps pretty heavily um, in a way that I find surprising and then don't highlight a lot of native apps that are out there, which is, yeah, it just feels kind of weird. Yeah. Are there any kind of design interaction things you think will change with those, you notice too? Like for me, I'm curious that people tab how that might evolve over the years and if we'll eventually get a FaceTime app and contacts app and they'll give up on that approach. Yeah, I don't really, I, they do this. It seems like with every new platform where they like people, people is its own. Yeah. I don't really get that. Um, yeah, it should just be a FaceTime app. Like that feels like the obvious thing there. Um, but yeah, in terms of design things, it like one of the, to me, the, the biggest thing is like window management needs to get, a lot better. I don't know what that is. I hopefully we see lots of experimenting and hopefully the answer isn't, well, it's just hard. Like the iPad apparently is. Um, so you can make stacks and stuff in a clever way. I can imagine. I don't know. Yeah. Or some kind of pinning or like, uh, it's funny because I appreciate that it's like free form like that. I like, I can just put it where I want. That makes sense. But then in practice, I don't really find that I can open very many windows, partially because the windows are so big Mm -hmm. that your field of view is filled up by one app generally, but like partially because like if an app ends up behind another one, it's how do I get that back? Like uh, listening to music is a situation that drives me crazy because it's like I open Apple music, I play a song and then I close it to minimize it. And then the song stops and it's like, ah, Interesting. So some like, apps keep playing in the background, like Overcast. I think if you close that app, it'll keep playing, right? Yeah, it's it's like a. I think it's. I think it's a. Like hmm, you as developer, I don't remember what I'm allowed to do say. You have but a way to keep spatial noise running if I close the window as an option. Not spatially. Um, you could because just like as a stereo thing. Yeah, it, it's very confusing because in the. Um, 
in the simulator, the simulator and the real device like behave differently. In the simulator, originally everything would keep playing, but then the only way you could stop it is by going to the control center and finding it to stop it or like reopening the app. Um, and that's unintuitive. And I'm guessing that's why. Um, so th- maybe that's just like, they need to figure out like widgets generally, but some kind of like notification center concept that's different than how the control center works now. So you can easily get to stuff one, to like pause music or whatever. One thing that struck me is Apple has four other taps they could implement if they want to. So you have the standard thumb and index. They could also implement system wide thumb and middle thumb and fourth finger thumb and pinky as system wide things that all do different things, which yeah, could, they could. Yeah. It could be interesting with that. I don't know, but you're getting into that. Like the thumb and index is already not a hundred percent reliable, which is already a lower bar than I think they would have accepted on any other paradigm that they've done. Mm-hmm. Um, but like clearly they want that to be as close to rock solid as humanly possible. And so I think, you know, other fingers are going to be potentially a ways away. Yeah. Um, before they'd be willing to take the lower like success rate. Um, Cause that has to be good. Right. I mean, that's part of what makes this such a revelation like their other devices is like, even with it being finicky, the uh, look and tap, model of interaction is just so good like it's so good compared to anything else um well compared to anything else without a controller yeah and so i i don't think they're gonna want to do anything to like confuse or make that less reliable anytime soon would be my guess yeah and i'm curious what reliability reliability would be like i know third party devs if you're in an immersive mode they have the ability to use your other fingers and it seems pretty good, but yeah, it's got to be less if it's trying to figure out. Between At the system level, it has yeah. to be like perfect. Yeah. Um, well, uh, yeah. And which again, like the fact that it's not currently is borderline unacceptable for like an Apple level of polish. Um, and you know, there's engineers that still are probably that is like they're just devoted to eking out any more improvements they can get to to get to the point where it's like the trackpad is now where it's just it's like you don't realize how good the trackpad is until you use, you know, a windows device, even now, even after they've gotten a lot better these days, it's still like, uh, dramatically better. Have you tried spatial personas at all yet? Yeah. To me, that's the, it's the most interesting thing where like this clicks as more than a like theme park ride type experience where I'm like, I see a, tangible benefit to this that i can't get with my other devices um and it mostly it's mostly the spatial persona version and it has everything to do with the fact that you can you can have a uh like multi-threaded conversation so if you're in a group with like four or five people it is technically possible now because i tested this with a group to have two sets of conversations happening at the same time and that to me has been the massive missing piece to every like video conferencing experience I've had when it comes to like work or like virtual conferences or something like that. Yeah, if you tried to do that in a Zoom call, that would just be chaos. Yeah, a Zoom call is is single threaded. There's a single pipe of audio. Everybody gets the exact same sound coming in and out. Um you also can't make eye contact. And I think the eye contact is a really important part of why that works. And obviously the spatial audio, um, that being said, the way that it's implemented right now, it's, it's kind of inorganic to do that. Like we did it to test this concept, right? So we're like, we walked over to other corners and it's kind of tricky because as soon as one person resets, everything kind of gets thrown off. Um, but it's like, okay, the technology is there to make this potentially possible where like, you could be hanging out with a group of people and it's not just a zoom call where one person's talking at a time. That being said, the way that the current FaceTime, or I guess they don't call it FaceTime, but you know, the implementation of that right now is it puts you all in a circle and you're all facing each other. And I found every time we did that, when we weren't intentionally trying to try out multiple conversations, it ended up being 
one person talks at a time. Everybody looks at the person talking. Like it feels more like a zoom call. Um, so I, I hope that at a like API level, they open up spatial personas um, in some of these concepts to let developers build a different type of experience um, than what we really have the ability to do now, um, which that to me is like really compelling and interesting. Because spatial personas are locked to FaceTime. Like Zoom could not integrate it directly to my knowledge, right? That's, uh, well, kind of. So like you can share play. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you can be using another app while using spatial personas. But I think that's like in the context of a FaceTime call. And I think the right. placement of people is you have like three choices. It's like they're in a circle, they're in a line or... I forgot what the other one is. Maybe it's just the two. Facing each other, maybe? Is that... That's well, but the, the circle. circle is the facing each right. other. It's okay. just If there's just two, they're facing each other. Um, but you can't, like, place people. Yeah, you as a developer can say, this is where one person should go because that's where the game board is kind of thing. Yeah. Like, what I want to be able to exist, uh, and, like, to step out even a higher level, just generally speaking, I want Apple to, like, give us some concept of locomotion like you have another VR without worlds. actually walking. Yes. <laughs> without actually walking. Right. Um, which is necessary, even though these spatial personas are like, they, I think they actually work better in AR mode, you know, pass through mode. Um, at that point you are in an environment that you want to move physically and everybody just kind of keeps resetting themselves, which works fine if it's just two people, but it's very, it's a lot more difficult if you have more than two people, but Zooming back in, what I what I'd love to exist is uh is some kind of app where you could like be like, I want to set up a meetup with these 10 people. And e- either you're in an actual like full VR space, or or maybe it could work with pastors somehow. But like you can at any point pick a spot and like move yourself there. So that that group of 10 or 15 people can be in like three different circles of conversations happening. And you can just walk or teleport, depending on the mode of locomotion that works between those. Um, that to me is like, that would be a major unlock. And I know everybody that like uses Horizon Worlds or whatever the meta one ver- is, are yelling like, we have this. And it's like, yeah, I think that's what I'm wanting is essentially what they have with the added bit of... Um, the eye tracking because i i really think that contributes a significant amount to the sort of resolution of the conversation because you can you can naturally break off into a one-sided conversation through eye contact yeah um which is a lot harder to do i think you know just in a sort of video game environment but yeah right now i don't think any of that's really possible but it feels like there's pieces in place that it could be yeah that'd be really killer because when i'm so I'm FaceTiming, I'm in a room that I can't move around that much. I got this one, uh, it's not a huge space. It, uh, I got a lot of obstacles. Right. I'd rather have, as you said, be able to teleport into these different groups and, you know, brainstorm with this person, jump over to another group, you know? Yeah. Because, like, to answer the question about just the current implementation of spatial personas, I have the same feeling I have about a lot of the stuff in Vision OS, which is... This is a really cool experience, or in this case, solution to a problem that exists because this is a platform you already live in. But what I struggle with is like, why am I living in this platform in the first place? That's like the kind of the missing link. And so spatial personas, it's like, it's a really clever, well, and same with the, uh, before there, but just the personas in general. Yeah. Yeah, right. It's like, I am incredibly impressed with that technology. I think it's like... I wish I could import these into uh, my video games as my avatar, quite honestly. Yeah, right. Yeah. (laughs) Like, they're legitimately very good. Like, very quickly, you just kind of get used to it and you move on. But I think they're just a dramatically worse uh, way to talk to somebody than a FaceTime call with my phone. Even a FaceTime call with like my old crappy Android front facing webcam uh, phone because like the amount of information lost because you're not looking at me and my surroundings anymore Mm -hmm. is just so insane. Um, 
but the thing that spatial persona is the newer version uh that's like in the 3d environment that at least gave some tangible benefit to sort of make up for it so i still wouldn't choose it most of the time like if i'm talking to my mom uh or family or almost anybody i ever facetime unless you want to play chess while having conversation which could be a fun way to like it's chess, interesting you know. But I would still, if I'm playing chess with like my sister who lives overseas, I would still rather be using a webcam and a video game, like a, a 3D video game where we can see each other while we're talking and doing it oh, personally. Because I want to see her. I want to be like, oh, you cut your hair or you yeah. look really tired. Or, how are you feeling? Her kid comes up and grabs her shoulder. And, oh, hey, how, how are you doing, yeah. buddy? All that's lost whenever it's uh, a, a virtual representation of so her. Most of that playing a video game with someone I'll either be audio chatting or, you know, that that's we're not even chatting at all kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'm weird. I, I don't necessarily like online gaming for that mm-hmm. main reason because it's like it feels like it's it, it's like it's for the game audio chat works great, but like for hanging out with somebody, I would much rather see them and see their facial expressions and you know what I mean? Um but yeah, if you're playing like a first person shooter or something, yeah, you only really need audio anyway. Yeah, because you can't look, you'll get shot if you're <laughs> distracted. By right. Up. But then in that case, it's like, yeah, the spatial personas are definitely a step up from a phone call. Right. For sure. But I'm not comparing it to a phone call. I'm comparing it to, you know, a video chat. Yeah. Well, any other general comments before we move on to our first main topic? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Char- chatting with Charlie. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I got, we can, we can just move on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this has been great. Um, lot, I mean, as a new platform, there is just so much to <laughs> dive into. I mean, it is. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So first up your app, spatial noise. Uh, what's kind of the quick elevator pitch for those that somehow don't know what it is. Um, so I mean, the idea of it is uh, I make an iOS app. I guess I didn't say this at the beginning, but the indie app, the main indie app I make is an app called Dark Noise, which is a white noise, ambient noise app that you play when you're trying to sleep or what I learned after releasing it. A lot of people use it when they're working to help focus, that kind of thing. Um, when this was first announced, I I obviously thought, okay, I immediately could see I think the main story here for dark noise on vision OS is the ability to play sounds just like you do anyway, but put those sounds in your environment. Specifically the story I always told myself was like, I want to put the rain sound on my window and then like a fan sound across my room where I actually have like a little space heater over there. And it's like with their spatial audio rendering uh, in particular, because they talk so much about, it's based on the room, which has turned out to be true. And I'm super impressed with that technology. Uh, It would make that feel so much more sort of immersive and sort of blend back into your background, which is kind of the point of the app anyway, um, even more. And so I was going to try and build that into dark noise. um, And I learned two things. One is like, I need to rebuild a lot of the UI because my, my app is designed to be kind of fun and have a personality Mm -hmm. And the native Vision OS world right now seems to be, please don't do that. We want everything to look exactly the same. It needs to be clear glass. Everything looks like a plain native app, um, which is a choice. Uh, but like, it's going to be hard to make Dark Noise fit that because it in- explicitly wasn't that, right? Um, and the other thing I learned is the simulator is worthless for building audio-based apps. Um, because it doesn't work the same way as a real device. And so I like, I was like, I, I literally just can't. Um, I learned that that's only partially true. If you're using specific APIs, it does work as you'd expect, but I'm doing things that require a little more control that are slightly lower level. Um, and for those, it just behaved totally differently than the real device did, which I learned when I did the lab. So after that, I was like, well, I guess I'll just wait for the real device and then I'll build it. Um, but then a week like a couple weeks before it actually came out, I realized I was like, you know what? I could just take the concepts and, and build a really like light version of the app that just has the feature I was talking about, which is you can place the sounds in a specific spot. The idea was 
Um, the way Vision OS works uh, naturally is sounds from an app are emitted from that window. And so, um, and this this will dive in a little bit to some of the problems with developing for Vision OS, but like you're super limited on what you can do in a sort of spatial sense for a Vision OS app, it, unless your app is a immersive app, which means that no other apps can be visible at the same time. So like my original idea was you could, build, I have like a sound mixer in the app. So my original idea was, okay, well I could take that sound mixer and I could let you like put sounds all around you. Yeah. And then you like save that as a saved like sound. And then you can just recall that anytime. Um, there's two problems. One, there's no concept of like a room, like a knowledge of a room uh, f- that we as developers get. I think vision OS has that internally, but we don't get that. Um, and the other problem is you can't do any of this stuff uh, unless you're an immersive app. And for my app, it would be pointless to be able to like create this cool 3d experience, but you literally can't see your writing app, which is the whole point is you're setting up so you can focus. But what are you focusing on if you can't see any other apps? So I thought it was kind of like, well, man, I guess I can't do this at all. But then I realized the OS naturally plays sounds from the window. So what if I just spawn each sound as its own window? Um, and so I built an app literally just doing that. So like it shows my list of sounds that I have in dark noise. Every time you click on one, it spawns a new window with its own play pause. And if you play it, it plays from that window. Um, and you adjust the volume per window, which is... Nice. Yeah, and so you can you adjust make, the volume yeah. per window. So you can build your mix. You have to redo it every single time. Um, but it lets you kind of build that. And the idea is like, if you're using this as a as a tool for writing or working or whatever, this is a nice like companion app for that environment. That was the idea. Gotcha. Um, yeah. I I built all that on the simulator and I finally got my device and loaded it up and it didn't work at all. Uh, (laughs) The, the spatial sounds all came from the original window. Um, And then I learned that some of the things that I thought I had learned at the lab were not true, apparently. Uh, And I had to rebuild the entire audio engine using a different piece of technology, which actually means I can't bring this to dark noise Um, because I do a lot of powerful things in dark noise, uh, which you can't do with, uh, reality kit is the technology yeah you kind of hijack the ios audio system in a way with what you do over there on dark noise right uh i mean yeah it's it's all like stuff you're intended to do yeah, and yeah. i'm actually building something much more powerful now that i'm very excited about but that even more so i wouldn't be able to do in this sort of context and so that's all pretty disappointing but um it's it was a very good exercise to build this in a small environment where i learned how it worked before I like rebuilt my whole UI and then learned that my audio layer was going to not work anyway uh, for dark noise. Yeah. You mentioned uh, how vision OS apps like to kind of disappear and that's very true. But the other approach you, you could have taken, which would have been a lot more time intensive would have been the skeuomorphic approach of, you know, you have, there's like the lava lamp battery app, you could have like a literal fan that's making noise that you place and like birds that are <laughs> chirping. Yeah, it would work the same as Windows. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It would it would have to be it would have to be what they call volumes, but like mm-hmm. it would have to have the little bar underneath that yes. the OS gives you because the moment I break out of that, it now has to be an immersive app, which means it can't mix with any other apps, which defeats the whole purpose. Totally. Yeah. So essentially, it would be the same exact thing as I have now, but it could have 3D objects 3D floating objects, in yeah. there. Yeah. Have you toyed around with that? I imagine that would just be way too much work. You'd only be able to do just a couple of the, the things like that if you wanted to. Yeah. I, the thing I was kind of playing with uh, was... Because right now, the whole app... Well, Dark Noise, at least... Uh, it's a bunch of every every sound has an icon and each one of those icons has a like 2D animation that goes with it while it's playing. Um, and I thought it would be cool to be to bring that like into 3D so that each one would be it would be the icon itself, almost like the Apple Design Award, if you've ever mm-hmm. seen that, like a block of aluminum that looks like a 3D version of an app icon. Um, I thought about doing that, but then I was like, functionally, it still needs to have a window so that you can control the volume. Um, and like 
the user base as we maybe we'll get to later for this is so small it's like spending time on that when i could be spending it building this really cool feature for dark noise for ios and ipad um it's really hard to justify spending any time on this thing yeah a uh development uh for love i guess you yeah. <laughs> know right yeah yeah exactly um have you considered a way of making like a mini player size window for the windows kind of like how apple music you can like hit the little thing and it becomes like just the icon of it well they're basically as small as i can get away with right now okay. um like it, it, it could get a little bit narrower but i wanted you to be able to s- change the volume um right but yeah they're all pretty much mini players right now now the thing i think maybe you're talking about is like collapse them into one window as opposed to it being a bunch of windows floating around. Well, I was actually wondering, like, collapse that small window into just the icon of what the sound is, with no way to adjust. Oh, no way yeah, to adjust. The you volume. could, yeah. And then you could tap on it, and then a volume thing could pop up, right. to make it a little bigger. Yeah, and that would that would make. I actually, I think I have that as one of my task things to maybe eventually do is like have it naturally be smaller unless you're changing stuff about it because the fact that they have to float there is yeah. kind of annoying. Yeah. I mean, you can kind of hide them behind the windows you're working in, but uh, yeah, they, they do have to float. I mean, <laughs> that's how the right. Well, works. and if they're there, then that's where the sound comes from. Right. You know? Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, does spatial noise, did you do any shortcuts integration? I know dark noise does quite a bit of this and I can imagine like have a shortcut. Let me launch my five favorite sounds and, yeah, that would be nice. Um, I haven't. I actually don't know. I haven't really dug into what the full scope of possibilities are with shortcuts on Vision OS. Um, my guess is it's probably pretty robust and I would be able to do similar things. The problem is, like, unlike on iOS or anything else, uh, you couldn't kick something off and it run in the background. It would have to open the windows. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. And I don't know, I could see there being issues where Vision OS would be like, no, you can't spawn more Windows yourself. <laughs> Users have to do that. Um, but I, I don't actually know the answer to that. Okay. But I, yeah, I, I haven't done it, I guess, okay. to answer your question. Yeah. yeah. Something I've noticed about Vision OS is it seems to let you do stuff in the background. Quite, I mean, not in the background, but like when I take the headset off, it'll keep downloading stuff from Safari and like do a bunch of stuff that uh, I think my iPad would complain about kind of thing. Oh, really? I would have thought like, cause the iPad does a lot in standby, right? I, I feel like if I like take off or shut the iPad screen <laughs> down, Safari will just stop downloading stuff. And like Luma fusion would stop exporting. And I, think Oh yeah. He, exporting. I maybe I could see does its exports. If I take the headset off, like, I'm pretty sure. Now that doesn't surprise me. My guess there is that has to do with uh, backgrounding. Yeah. Because on the iPad, it's like, or iOS, it's pretty like as soon as something gets backgrounded, it's like, all right, like you're no longer running. You get a couple seconds to end things and then you can kick off background tasks, but it's not just going to keep running. Whereas, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. So in Vision OS, like nothing gets backgrounded the same way because the windows are still active kind right, of like yeah. on Mac. Um, but what I don't know is you would expect that if you take it off your head, that it would be like iOS where it backgrounds everything instantly. Maybe that's why the battery goes down so fast. Yeah, I think it do- does a lot when it's off, which I bet that's a bug. Yeah, maybe that'll get fixed. In I, the- I kind of appreciate this ability, but maybe it's unintentional. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I get what you're saying. Uh, for all the limitations of iPad OS and Vision OS that are annoying, I do think the the like the standby battery life of modern devices is so amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, that to me is a pretty big feature because, like, I find myself immediately plugging it in or disconnecting the battery as soon as I take it off now because otherwise it'll be dead next time I try to put it on. Oh, interesting. Which is really as annoying. a daily user, this is not an issue I have because most time I'm not expo- even like overnight. Yeah, most time I'm not exporting video or I'm not like queuing up a thousand downloads in the Apple TV app. If I do that, I'll plug it in. But otherwise, I will take it off at like 11 p.m. and then put it on at set 8 p.m. the next day, 
and I've and you got, don't plug it in. Don't plug it in. It'll just be plugged in huh. its little case. And I've got at least fifty percent battery. You know, pretty much every time. A lot. That's a interesting. Lot I feel like that. if I leave mine for a couple hours, um, the next time I put it on, it'll be dead somehow. And I'm like, how did this happen? That's that's bizarre to me. Um, the only thing I could think of maybe. I don't know ta- photos that are still like sinking down, or I don't know if like your iCloud well, drive. But most of the time, I leave it plugged in for that same reason because yeah, I'm like, maybe it's doing something. Now, to be to be fair, I'm quick to jump on betas as well, so like okay. that very possibly could be part of that. The only other thing I could think of is if you're super active in iCloud Drive, I'm not most days. I am not. Okay, I was gonna <laughs> say like iCloud Drive could be constantly like just refreshing with like. Yeah, I don't think I don't think it would be related to that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, because for me, yeah, I've had it happen like once or twice. And one time, something weird happened where it nuked my persona, and the battery was totally dead. Something weird. <laughs> happened oh, I had interesting. To reset my persona up uh because it nuked that in the process of the battery die which i thought huh. was quite the i wonder too if i live like like an apple commercial version of a uh, handoff like my desk is you know studio display macbook pro my personal macbook pro is next to it my ipads over here i have multiple phones so whenever i hit copy i also use the paste app Every time I hit copy on any device, I just hear like click, 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 all over because everything's, which is like incredible. I just, one of my favorite things about living in this ecosystem. But I wonder if like something related to that also causes the, uh, even when it's in standby, it's like talking to all these devices sure. constantly. Maybe there's something related to that. I it's don't know. definitely aware of all the devices. Like I, one thing, I think I pointed on the podcast before, but um, if you're, trying to type something on your apple watch your vision your apple vision pro will get a little notification pop up and you can type on your apple watch from your vision pro if you if you have like a keyboard on your vision pro it might be faster you can type on your apple watch yeah what so next time you have your vision pro on start uh-huh. typing something on your apple watch like pull up what messages. does that pull mean mess- though like how up, do i pull up messages on like your apple watch and if the keyboard is active on your apple watch uh, your Vision Pro will get the little circle notification of your Apple Watch icon. If you tap it, you'll get the ability to type from your Vision Pro <laughs> onto your watch. Oh, you can type from your Vision Pro. You can type for your Apple Watch, not the other way. Right, not the other way. Oh, weird. Yeah. See, I think it would be easier to type on my Apple Watch <laughs> than the Vision Pro because that <laughs> that's another area uh, yeah. where uh, I would love to see some improvements. <laughs> yeah, uh, most a lot of times I have a Bluetooth keyboard and otherwise dictation yeah. is my friend sometimes i can't dictate and i it can take a while to to do the little eye typing yeah the whis the whisper dictation from vision pro sometimes is pretty impressive though like i'll just be like whispering and it doesn't whisper de- oh like just dictation while you're whispering yeah it's kind of pretty impressive how sometimes i can get that pretty well if i'm trying to be quiet i find i just am not a uh like talk to my devices type person. Yeah. Um, even when I'm like, this would clearly be the better option. I just, I think I don't do it enough. And so I don't know the right ways of doing it, I guess. Um, but I end up spending more time correcting it than if I just typed it all out in the first place. And so I end up just typing everything. Yeah. And sometimes if it, it'll make a comedic mistake and I'll just add to the end of that dictation, LOL, like (laughs) they figure it out. Yeah. And that's, that's maybe that's it is I'm too, uh, I'm too uptight about, you know, it not having mistakes in it. Right. With spatial noise, have you experimented, experimented with, um, using your app within environments? Like I'm at the beach or at the, the lake or whatever. And let me add a thunderstorm to where I'm at kind of thing. (laughs) Yeah, it works for that. Um, it's interesting because the environments themselves have sounds. Yeah, you're competing with the environments themselves, um, which is kind of yeah. interesting. And you can, like, I guess, like add to their soundscape with your own, which is interesting too. Yeah, yeah, and it, I think it makes sense for that. Uh, I, like I said, I don't, I don't really use I, like if I am just like in the Vision Pro, just using it. I tend to not use the environments very much. Yeah. Um. I'll I'll use like if I'm watching a movie, um, I will sometimes use the I always use the dark 
uh, the sand one, the, but the dark version of it because it's the brightest dark one. Uh, because I've noticed watching anything that's too, if the, if the environment's too dark, you get all those like reflections and that drives me nuts. Um, so the sand one is like, you know, it has like the kind of sunset in the distance. I so there's love enough the, the, the sunset because most dark ones, it's, yeah. it's like dark and this one, it's got the sunset. It's just black. It's so nice. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, so it's enough like color and stuff that mm. there's not as many of those bad reflections that you get. Um, and then, and then like the movie you're watching blends with the environment the fake environment's a lot better than the real environment yeah um and like if like if you're on an airplane especially it's very disorienting if you're watching a screen like through the seat in front of you um yeah that that tech or the way they do that still impresses me like my brain kind of just like makes it work like oh sure my screen's halfway through my house that's fine (laughs) like it, it kind of works for me the way they do it, um, blending. Yeah, it together. works for me if I'm using an environment. I, I find it's like, it's too, you know, like I have computers and stuff on my desk. And so if I'm at my desk and I have windows pushed back from my desk, because it's kind of mm-hmm. uncomfortable to have stuff close. Sure. Um, I find that is really weird where it's like, it's covering my laptop but it's behind my laptop. My brain does not like that. And so it kind of doesn't feel very good. But the, I think the environments are like perfect. They're like a little portal um, where your stuff lives. Yeah. And the glare thing, I don't know if it's just because I've seen so much at this point. I just kind of forget it's there, I guess. Because I'll use the Apple TV environment most of the time, the theater, or like if I'm watching, like occasionally I've got 20 minutes to kill at night. I don't want to queue up a movie or whatever i'll throw up seinfeld and a uh, lake top the lake t- um environment is like it's just, it's yeah. delightful seeing the reflections down the lake of Seinfeld. yeah there. that's it's that's like, my go-to like demo uh environment because it's like look at the reflections they're like whoa yeah um yeah i agree i do like that one and yeah for like watching seinfeld i don't think it would really bother me that much right yeah. um for me, there's two there's two types of reflections. There's the reflections from the outside world coming in. And that's I think that's more of like my light seal is relatively comfortable, but there's just the slightest amount of gap. Okay. Yeah. And so I I've that. noticed yeah. if I like physically pinch it in, I can actually reduce the glare a little bit. Okay. Um and then so that's one, and that one makes sense. But if I'm in a dark room, then it's not as bad, obviously. Mm-hmm. But then the other one is like internal to the in actual headset. And that's where if I'm if I'm in a like black environment, uh, like VR environment in the headset and I'm watching a movie with like bright stuff, um, I'll, I'll notice like reflections there sometimes. Gotcha. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. And it it's kind of funny. It's like some apps don't do the environments at all. And like it kind of has encouraged me to I want to buy this in from iTunes. <laughs> like it's, I want uh, Vision OS two. Let me use the Apple TV environment uh, with Anywhere? any video. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's one of my that's one of my Vision OS two wish list items as well. It's like there's two versions of it. There's one is like just like uh, the default full screen on iOS or iPad OS or any of these things. It's like I want that to be there's a default and then you can put literally anything inside of these environments. Like it feels like that should just be how it works generally. Mm -hmm. Especially Um, with the videos you launch from the Apple TV app itself, you know, let those take advantage of, you know, they're integrating with your Apple TV. Well, those can, right? Those are the only ones that can, right? Well, only if they're an Apple TV channel, I think, or I see what you're saying. Right. Like, like cause I've got Paramount streaming from the Apple TV app, not opened from the Apple yeah, TV. Not app. opened. Yeah. Cause like, I see what you're saying. Yeah, some, some apps will open from it. Like, like Disney HBO. plus can open from it, but it's, it's within the Disney, you know? Yeah. Right. Yes. Agreed. Um, and then the next thing is like, it feels like it would be amazing if third parties could plug into that. Like, obviously, third parties can make environments because, like, Disney's doing that and HBO's doing that, but it's only inside of their own apps. They should be able to vend those. Like, I should... What what would be amazing is if I'm a Disney Plus subscriber and I have unlocked it in the app, I should be able to use that Disney Plus environment 
anywhere. Sure. But it's only if I'm a subscriber, you know what I mean? Like, so I'm still paying for it or whatever. And I should be able to build as a developer, I should be able to build a cool environment and then vend that to the system. And now somebody can sit there and, you know, work on Xcode in Charlie's office or, you know, yeah. but like some are actually cool. Like you that could, would be incredible. You could have a set of spatial noise environments. You can make your own airplane that we could work in with the airplane, the sound. I, yeah, that's a good point, <laughs> actually. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. That would be super, super cool. But that one feels like it's like if they still haven't given us third party watch faces, um, maybe I should just never expect that. But if they're looking for things to try and make this platform even more exciting, that would be huge because then you could have these things coming out regularly and getting people excited, you know? Um, and they could be separated like, off third party environments so they don't get confused by the high quality Apple ones that they may not be as high quality with third parties for some of them, you know? Yeah, you, right. Like in it's, its own section in the environments yeah. uh, tab or whatever. But yeah, it's like I should be able to work from Bush Stadium where my St. Louis Cardinals yeah. play baseball. Like, that should be a thing where like, or better yet, m- the MLS team in St. Louis, uh, there should be a thing where they, they're like, Hey, you can use the 3d, the special 3d camera that we make and you can scan an environment. Cause it's stadium, especially you don't need a lot of depth there. Um, you could build that really easily, but then obviously it should scale up to really rich, like 3d assets like Disney's doing. Yeah, for sure. Um, anything else about spatial noise uh, before we move on to the monetization uh, story here? Um, I don't think so. It's not. I mean, I again, I sound like down on it. Um, part of it with spatial noise is like I didn't spend that much time on it. Right? It was, it was kind of a last minute. Like, oh, I can get something out on day one, and I was really proud to be part of that. Like, I do think that's pretty cool. To be able to look back and be like, yeah, I was part of that initial 500 or 600 apps, um, way less so that were actually native app, like uh, Vision OS only native apps. Um, And that was cool. I think part of my, uh, what's the right word? Maybe negative sounding tone is like, it's just frustrating as a dev when it's like, but I can't make the thing I want. Uh, which seems right. to be a recurring story. Yeah, the mixing board and mixing in a space, which that would be a cool thing at some point for them to add Vision OS probably five, you know, yeah. ways off. Well, the idea that I can't bring that to dark noise is also mm. a little frustrating. Yeah, because it's it's different audio system that runs in Vision OS. Is that the thing? Essentially, like, um, if I'm using a traditional low level, AV Foundation is like kind of the the level of APIs that um, I'm using. If I'm, if I'm working at that low level, uh, you can play audio from like, there's one sort of audio session for an app. So I can have it play from the main window or I can have it play uh, ambiently around you. Like the music app plays ambiently. It's not fixed to that window. I can make that choice. And so my understanding was I could then hook it to any window and I found the APIs to do that, but it turns out it just doesn't work that way. So if you're using those low level audio APIs, you literally can't hook it to a specific window. There's only ever going to be one. Um, it's only if you use that much higher level, but way less control reality kit, mm-hmm. uh, where then I can say, all right, this noise is playing from this thing, but literally all I can do is say you loop yes or no. Yeah. I can't do any of my fading and all the stuff that I normally do, which kind of drives me crazy. Yeah. I will say I really just like the interaction of spawning new windows in your app. Like it's just, it's, it's fun to just like just boom, boom, boom. And like the way I think it's one of the best ways to demo spatial audio, like um, in terms of like, obviously the, like the dinosaur experience and stuff, it's coming from a 3d thing. I mean it in the more like, you have full control sense. Like you can just pop up in rain and you can pull it really close to you and push it really far away. And you're like, Whoa, that's dramatically different. Yeah. Like that to me is very fun. The audio system and vision. It's just a con it constantly is just impressing me. Like just how well oh, yeah. it's just thought out, you know? Yeah. Even walking around my house from my small office to my bigger loft area, I can hear the sound change, especially spoken voice. Yeah. Um, it's like, man, they really are doing like 
live rendering of the head related transfer function to give you that sort of sense of space, which is just very cool. Yeah. I wonder if they'll ever add a mute option in control center or if they're so proud of this system that they don't want anything ever muted. Oh, <laughs> uh, is there not? There's not a mute. It's the only OS Apple offers that has no mute option. You can turn down the sound, the speaker volume, but you can't mute anything. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So like, I think get, the control center in general is going to be a space where they need to they need to spend some time uh, with each of these first couple releases to figure out how to make that work because we yeah. really it needs some form of like quick access controls because um, that's something that you know you can quickly change the environment and even changing the volume is slow right now because it's like yeah looking like if something's really loud and it's hurting your ears you can't just be like oh you know and turn it down you have to kind of like start to turn it and then find the volume get the eye tracking to actually track it which it's a lot worse when you're looking up which is where it is is. and so you're kind of like come on come on come on and then you finally get it and then for whatever reason those two dials are delayed i don't know if you've noticed that well most Um, of the time i just use the airpod uh gesture see yeah and on the airpods it's instant yeah uh yeah, which you're right. That's true. Because if I'm using my AirPods, I don't have that yeah, problem. Yeah, most time if I'm doing um, speaker pods, it's for more ambient stuff or, you know, something just, you know. I'm just constantly, yeah. like, I'm constantly throwing these on to test something or somebody's like, hey, is my app showing up in whatever list? Or, you know, people who don't have the device, I'm like kind of the send them screenshots guy, uh, which is why I made an app basically for screenshots. Um, and that, that is like almost oh, always just right. using the regular I that was pods. Your creation as well. what, what's that app called again? Oh, uh, level headed. Yeah. Level headed. Yeah. Brilliant app to just, yeah, like, that was like a dumb, that that's the fastest I've ever made an app ever for anything. Um, cause it was like it, taking screenshots is kind of a pain. I'm sure you've noticed this. It is because wild tried to have a even head. Uh, yeah. yeah having your head be level, uh, turns out is not something I do naturally. And then also where is it actually framed up? Cause mm-hmm. it's framed up based on your left eye, which is a little weird on its own. Right. Um, and so, yeah, it's just a series of levels. And then also I draw sort of a 3d box that represents where it's going to take the picture. Yeah. Um, but that's one, that's an example of, I had to make that an immersive app because you can't do any of that stuff without it being an immersive app. Yeah. But that means that the thing you're trying to take a screenshot of is hidden when my app's open. Right. So you kind of have to like open it, figure out what you want to do and then close it, reopen the app and don't move your head at all, which is very weird, but it at least helps a little bit. No, the screenshots are just, it's, it's quite the thing. And you have to like use an app like Photomator if you want to crop it. Cause there's no cropping or anything in the photos app. <laughs> Yeah, and that's that's something that just needs to come and yeah, yeah, it will, Vision sure. OS two or something. Because uh, yeah, that is a no. I do frequently find myself taking the headset off so I can open my phone and then f- trim a video or crop a picture or something. Yeah. Oh, as as far as window size, I, I've noticed this. I, I think I mentioned it on a previous episode, but um, Juno, I've noticed Juno's windows get bigger than anyone else's windows on the entire her operating system. <laughs> oh, really? I don't know if I next time you're in Juno, try to make the window big and it'll just I think he has like unlocked window size enabled where it just just goes infinitely large. Does Safari does Safari limit you more? I think so. Yeah. Like a lot of apps oh, will bounce interesting. back. Like if you reach a maximum size, it'll just bounce yeah. back. Juno, I've not encountered a bounce back in that app. <laughs> Oh, that's very. Oh, I need yeah. to try that. I asked Christian about that because I, cool, I did not like, pick up on that. You can have some wildly big videos a lot of times. Yeah, it's, it's annoying. Yeah. You can't push stuff back farther. Agreed. Like you can if you physically walk over there. Yeah, um, and in an but you can't walk through your wall. Especially, I feel like I should be able to push them way further back than they are, and then make them super big. Yeah, like if you full screen a movie, it'll push it way far back and yeah. make it big. It's like, I want to do that manually because I want it slightly different than where they put it. I also feel like if I feel like I'm not sure if this is true, but if I push a a window all the way back, I turn on environment maximum. I feel like it's pushing the window closer to me in some way. I don't know if that's true or not, but it feels like that's happening. Yeah. 
But yeah, Vision OS 2, I want Windows <laughs> further back. Like, let me. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's more comfortable. Yeah, further that would back. be very nice. Yeah. So uh, monetization. Um, what did what route did you actually go for with spatial noise? Because uh, as we'll talk about, there's like, there come some different options you as a developer can pick. Can pick. Yeah. So for spatial noise, uh, that one is a it's a one time purchase in the app. Okay. Uh, so you there's like six or eight like sounds that are free, and then mm -hmm. after that you pay, and then you unlock them all. It's a one time payment. Cool deal. Um, so we will do a very quick, just wrap up with monetization, um, part of your day job or your day about job is at revenue cat. And you gave a talk over in China at what was the conference called? It's called let's vision OS. Let's vision OS. Okay. Very cool. And what was kind of the scene like there? It was crazy. It was, <laughs> yeah, it, it's the biggest iOS conference I've ever been to outside of dub dub. Um, I think there was over 700 people there. Um, and so, yeah, it was really big and it was like, it was just fun being in a place as much as you're listening yeah. to be, be all negative here. It was fun being in a place where everybody was just excited, uh, about this thing. And there's people just walking around with headsets everywhere, which <laughs> felt like you were in like some Blade Runner movie or something. It was very funny. Uh, people yeah. are walking around, you know, with their hands. Uh, it was it was just fun having that many people that are all into a semi obscure thing all kind of together and yeah. everybody like this thing's brand new. Nobody really knows what they're doing with it. And it, the, the atmosphere was very, uh, was very, very fun. That that's cool. Uh, it was a multilingual or mostly English, uh, there. Um, it was, it was definitely multilingual. Uh, it was like 99% of the attendance, uh, I'm just pulling that out of my butt, but like it was mostly Chinese attendees. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Speakers were, were from kind of all over the place. Um, I, I don't know the makeup. It felt like maybe half of the talks were in Mandarin and the other half were in uh, English. And then they had, they had different mechanisms for live translating. When I did mine, it was like the top, you know, chunk of my screen mm -hmm. was like a live translation that was kind oh, of going cool. as i was talking and any interesting talks outside of yours that uh caught your eye while you were there uh i was working a booth uh and i was the only person from revenue cat there which usually we have like kind of a big team and so uh i basically spent the entire time in non-stop talking mode uh with lots of people so i only got to go i went to my friend Devin uh gave a talk and his was awesome and so i went to his um and it was Bruton. kind of an introduction into like yeah, yes, Crouton Devin. He's been on this show before, yes. right? Was he in the first episode of the show? I think so, yeah. Am I remembering that? Yeah, yeah. One or two, yeah. Um so I saw his, but I didn't I didn't see anybody else's uh because I was working the booth the whole time. Any um weird stories from China? It's first time there? Uh it was my first time there. Extremely cool. Uh, I really, really want to go back now. Um like there's so many different cities I want to see now. I, I happened to have a, uh, it was, it was supposed to be six hours ended up being like a five hour layover in Shanghai. Yeah. Um, and so I was like, you know what? I think I can go see that new Apple store that just opened yeah. the like flagship Asia Apple, Apple store in Shanghai. So I got on there like a maglev train and went into the city and saw an Apple store and then went and got food somewhere and then ran back to the airport. Uh, <laughs> it felt kind of crazy uh, yeah. to do, but it was, it was pretty fun. But yeah, it was, it was an incredibly cool place uh, to go. Got to see the Great Wall, got to see the Forbidden City. Um, so yeah, That's highly cool. recommend if you ever have the opportunity. Yeah. The people I, there are unbelievably kind and nice uh, in a way that was delightful. That's awesome. Yeah. One, one day. Um, quickly on monetization. Um, did an awesome blog post. I'll link it in the show notes for people to read it through. Uh, conversion rates, you were saying, were actually pretty good as far as what you've been experiencing and talking with other de developers. Is that can you share a bit on, like, there's not a lot of people here, but people are seeming to buy stuff? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of a, um, it's, it's, it's kind of a classic case study of like market segmentation. So, like, it's like take the iOS uh, group of users and cut them into like a thousandth. <laughs> yeah. But the thousandth that you cut are going to be the people that are more likely to pay more money than normal. So, 
I mean, it still comes out way, way behind uh, all the other platforms. But the users that are there are way more willing to spend money, um, generally speaking. So there's some money to be made. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. But I would not recommend getting into this with the idea that you're going to make a lot of money right now because that is incredibly unlikely. Yeah, there's a social network thing on Vision OS. And what, what I've heard from people that have used it is like you're connecting and talking and having chats with people that are also not 12 year old kids. So it's that kind of a good experience. Right oh, now. that's interesting. Yeah. Is that uh, in inverse yeah, in, uh, in space or something? Or in space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, he was at he was at that conference. Yeah, uh, the, 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 I think have, he was like, a discussions with people. And it's like, I, I've, I have an account. I need to use it more. Um, well, anything else uh, before we wrap it up? I don't think so. Thank you for having me on. Sorry uh, for being sort of <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> the, yeah. the sort of pessimist that I feel <laughs> like I always sound like I am in these circles. Um, I really do like the thing. I have it sitting next to me. <laughs> I, I, I try it regularly. Um, I just, I just haven't figured out, you know, where, where it lands in most people's like long-term like regular life use case. And I'm still looking for that, but yeah, every time they come out with something new, it's kind of like, Ooh, there's a piece of something. I can see a niggle of an idea there that if they keep expanding on that, this could be something really special. So, um, I'm still, I'm still very hopeful for the future of it. Yeah. It'll be an exciting, uh, couple. I'm, I'm just excited to see the next like five years because new platforms every year is just like, just exciting, you know, as things change. Yeah. And- yeah. It's, it's it, the big test is like, do we, do we see big advancements or is it just like nothing's moving at all? Yeah. Um, watch us too. We got, and that's the, we got that's the test a completely rewrite on how apps were done. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we'll see what, what stuff they have in store for June. It should be exciting either way. Uh, where can folks follow you online and learn more about spatial noise? Um, I'm on like all of the social media platforms. Uh, the easiest way to find me is charliemchapman.me is like the website that points to everywhere else. Uh, I think on Twitter, it's underscore Chucky C. Almost everywhere else, it's Charlie M. Chapman. Um, but yeah, I'm on Twitter, Mastodon. Uh, threads you know whatever new one pops up by the, between now and when this episode comes out cool deal. I'll be there probably too well, thanks Charlie for your time today I really appreciate uh, learning more about uh, uh, spatial noise and monetization and uh, our uh, lots of tangents up front there <laughs> yeah <laughs> awesome thanks for having me well that's my discussion with Charlie my thanks again to Charlie's first time recording my thanks to you for your time and attention tuning in Make sure to check out Spatial Noise on the Vision OS App Store. As a reminder, you can support this podcast by reviewing the podcast over at Apple Podcast or by heading over to visionpros.fm slash Patreon and supporting either the Patreon or by subscribing in Apple Podcasts. My great thanks to everyone that supports the show. With that, I'll talk with everyone again real soon.